Today, we have someone very special who's bringing the word today. Now, he's somebody that was really, uh, was raised up in the streets of San Bernardino, dealing drugs, living a life that was totally contrary to God's will for his life. How many know what I'm talking about? Just in, in the streets doing crazy things. Now, he got saved in San Bernardino. He came to the way, totally uh, fell in love with God and got on fire for Jesus. Now, he is making a major impact in our cities. He's done led outreaches, not just in this city, but in cities and states all over the country, even all over the world. He's, people, pastors have been calling him to preach at their campuses, to teach them how to do outreach, to teach them how to love the community. He is not afraid to go to the darkest neighborhoods in the country or the inner cities all over the world. And he is a part of our church. Really, he's an evangelist pastor. He's our outreach director here at the Way World Outreach. So I want you to give a big Way World Outreach welcome to Andrew Alcana. Come on, let's hear it for him. Let's hear it for him. Come on, let's give him a round of applause. Yes. Let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. Over 1,600 people have gotten saved this month alone. That's not happening at every church, but it's happening here at the Way World Outreach. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for every soul that was reached this month. And we praise you, God, in advance for all the souls that are coming to taste and see that you are good. And they're going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, you're in the right place to be today. God has a word for you. And say this, say, we're at an amazing church. Let's give it up for our senior pastor, Pastor Marco, Pastor Lisa. They're doing an amazing job. He's preaching at the Arrowhead campus. Let's give it up for our campus pastors, Pastor Christian and Pastor Yesenia. Aren't they doing a good job too? And man, take a look around you. Like this is an army. Like this is an army that can't be stopped. This is an army that's dangerous. Like this is a battleship. This isn't a cruise ship. Like we're coming here today we're coming to learn, we're coming to equip, and everything we get today, we're going to reach those people that are lost outside. Amen? Battleship. Because I go to some churches, they're like a cruise ship. But this ain't, this, this is a battleship right here. We're ready for war. We're armed. We're ready. We got our boots to the ground. We're ready, right? Man, you guys go ahead and be seated. Tell your neighbor... We're in the right place. And look at your other neighbor and say, get ready. So, you know, you guys know that this month has been soul winning month. And, man, the title of today, man, is Jesus, friend of sinners. Think about that. Friend of sinners. Because there's been relationships in your life. You've had a best friend or that close friend, and you guys were inseparable. Maybe you call them your day ones. Day ones is somebody that you were raised from a little, little child, and they're still your friend. That's my, that's my day one. But in all these relationships that you've had, they were close, they were your best friend. Most of us and some of us have been let down in these relationships through a disagreement, through an argument through being offended, and all of a sudden, that best friend just wasn't your best friend anymore. All of a sudden, that connection that you once had, and then you go years, five, ten years, next thing you know, they were your best friend, and you haven't spoken to them in such a long time. So when I think about friendship, because a lot of us have been let down in our friendships at some point or another, let's think about Jesus. Like, Jesus is faithful when we're so unfaithful. Jesus is so loyal when you're never loyal. Jesus is so loving. Jesus is so caring. Like, how many times has he forgiven you for the same thing? But I think about this, like you could be living a selfish life for your entire life, 
30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. You could be living a life full of self, pleasing yourself, indulging in sin, not even thinking, acknowledging, or recognizing God, not even at one moment in your life, but on your deathbed, if you call on the name of the Lord, he'll come to your side like you've been serving him your whole life. That's a great friendship. That's the best relationship. And I think sometimes in life, we're so invested on our earthly relationships that we forget about the best relationship that anyone could ever have, and that's a relationship with Jesus. His love is patient. His love is kind. His love keeps no record of wrongs. His love never fails. Guess what? A relationship with Jesus is failed proof. Guaranteed to not fail you. And you've been invested in every relationship that has failed you at some point or another. And I pray we get a different understanding that Jesus is a friend. A friend to the sinner. So if you're watching today, whether no matter where you're at in life, God wants to meet you right where you're at in the condition that you're at. And yes, this is a sermon series on reaching the lost. But for all the saved people in the house, you were once lost too. And you've been serving God for five years, ten years. Guess what? You drift off still. Guess what? You wander off and you stray away from time to time because you still get in your feelings. So you could be here and say, well, man, I've been gunning, running and gunning, serving the Lord. 24-7. But yeah, when, when life shows up and the bills show up and the health starts breaking down, right? And then, and then we start to panic, we start to be afraid, and we start trusting in what we see instead of the one that could set us free. Amen? So point number one, Jesus has compassion for the sinner. He has compassion for you. He sees your hurt. He sees your pain. Like, I get it. People might not see it. I get it. You may have shared your pain with somebody else, and they couldn't understand you. But guess what? Jesus understands you. He knows what you're going through, and he's not just going to sit back and do nothing. He is literally ready to move on your behalf. He's ready to move on your behalf right now. Like you came here, 11 a.m., God has an appointed word for you. Let's go to Matthew 9, 36. But when he saw the multitudes, the multitudes consisted of hundreds and thousands of hurt and wounded and broken and lost people. It said he was moved with compassion. Everybody say compassion. He had compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Let's look at the word compassion. In the Greek, it means splagnizomai, which refers to a deep feeling of empathy and concern for others. So Jesus has empathy for you, meaning he understands your pain. He, he, he's went through the pain before, like he understands it. And guess what? He's ready to move on your behalf. It says it's a deep feeling of empathy and concern for others. The term is often used in the New Testament to describe Jesus' response to the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of those he encountered. Matter of fact, the word compassion is penned 14 times alone in the Gospels. So we got to pay attention that compassion was the driving force behind the ministry of Jesus before he moved to heal before he moved to set somebody free, before he, before he healed the leper, before he healed the blind, it was compassion that moved him first. So in Latin, it means to suffer with. It's the connection of suffering with another person. It brings compassion beyond sympathy into the realm of empathy. I get it. Sometimes we see a person in need, we have sympathy, but we go home. We do, nothing, we do nothing about it. Jesus isn't like me and you. Like when he sees somebody that's hurting, he sees somebody that's broken, he stops and he moves on their behalf and he's willing to do whatever he has to do to heal your pain. 
The, co the combination of being moved internally and then acting in response is the essence, the essence of compassion. When we empathize, we are attempting to understand or experience what another person understands or feels. Now, when it says that they were weary in this scripture, like weary means tired. It means fatigued. Has anybody ever been tired of life? Like life just wore you out? Has anybody ever been exhausted? It, the word weary describes a desert wanderer that was about to faint. And sometimes when we have no direction in life, we have no purpose in life, we tend to wander through life. And a person that's wandering has no vision, has no fo focus, and a person that's wandering is willing to try anything that comes their way. The word scattered means lost. Has anybody in here ever been lost before? Like it doesn't feel good. Like just imagine losing your phone and you have no power and you can't put it in your phone to find your way out. Like if you were in the middle of nowhere, you lost your phone, I guarantee you the, 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 the idea of feeling lost, that's not a great feeling to have. But some of us are lost spiritually right now. That word scattered also means straight away. Some of us have strayed away. Some of us have drifted away. Scattered also means lack of guidance, lack of support. Has anybody ever felt all alone in their life? Like you may have a support system, but because the problems keep beating you down and the waves of life keep beating you down, you can't see anybody and you can't even hear anybody and you feel all alone. I think about Jesus when the disciples were in the storm, like the storm shook them, the storm rattled them. But I want to encourage somebody, don't focus on the sound of the storm, focus on the one that could silence the storm. Don't focus on the sound. See, we pay attention to the noise and we pay attention to the thoughts in our head that nobody loves me and I'm not good enough and I'm not strong enough and I feel all alone and I have no support system. See, we got to be careful of the noise and we got to be careful of the lies and we got to start focusing on the one that could silence the lies. Amen? Lack of support. Lack of sense of direction. You're uncertain of where to go. Really, you're confused. Now, Jesus, he understood what those feelings were like. He recognized that the people were lost, and he moved to meet their needs based off what he saw and felt. He saw the people in their condition, and he was moved to do whatever he could do to help them. It says, they were like sheep without a shepherd. Like a sheep without a shepherd, they're helpless, they're defenseless, they're in grave danger. They could fall prey to a thief, a robber, to any kind of animal could kill a sheep. Like think about that. But that's what Jesus was saying when he saw the people, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And there's some people in here, you're a sheep without a shepherd. You're lost, you're confused, you have no sense of direction, and you're still trying to figure life out on your own willpower, on your own strength, and on your own resources. And guess what? You don't have to try to figure it out anymore. There's a savior in the house, and he wants to lead you on the right path. Now, I want you guys to understand this. He sees your hurt. He sees your pain. He knows what it's like. Well, what do you mean? Like, like you got to understand, when he went up to the cross, when he had to endure the cross, his disciples, the 12 people that were closest to him, they deserted him. They left him high and dry. The people that said, we're going to be with you until the day you die. Like Peter said, I'm going to be with you no matter what. And we know how that turned out. Right? So he knows what it's like to be abandoned. He knows what it's like to feel all alone. What about when he was in the garden of Gethsemane and he was dripping sweats of blood? You know why he was dripping sweats of blood? Because of the agony and the tormenting thoughts that he had to think of just to face the cross and endure the cross and overcome the cross. That was so much for him to endure. 
So he understands your torment. He understands your pain because a lot of times in life we're like, man, nobody understands me. I get it, but he understands you. He knows what you're going through. And if you're here today, all you need is a touch from him, but you got to be willing to receive today. He knows what it's like. And then when he was hanging on that cross, like that was the, that he died a criminal's death. That was the, and he was a public spectacle. He was embarrassed. He was humiliated. And some of you guys, you go through those feelings, you feel like, well, I'm all alone. Hey, I got good news for you. You're not alone. He understands, and he's ready to heal you. He's ready to move on your behalf. Somebody say amen. So, Drew, what do we have to do? This is what we have to do. We have to start acknowledging our need for God as a church as a nation, as a country, as a community. This ain't just for the church people. This is for everybody in the room. We have to acknowledge our need for God. We acknowledge, this is what happens when life gets hit, when it hits you, trust me, I'm in the same boat as you. When life gets hit and the problems are high and the pain is high and the, and the thoughts keep coming, we acknowledge the problem. We acknowledge the pressure. We acknowledge the pain. And this is what happens when you acknowledge pain. You recognize it. You focus on it. You magnify it. And next thing you know, that problem has power and authority over your life. And because it has power and authority over your life, you put your trust in your own feelings and emotions. And next thing you know, you start drifting off. And I don't care how long you've been serving God, you're not always on the right path. Because you could be sitting in here, well, I'm not like that anymore. But guess what? You still make dumb decisions from time to time. You could be a woman of God for 10 years, but all it takes is a, all it takes is a so-called man of God to come your way. And next thing you know, you compromise because he comes to church, he looks the role, he plays the role, he sounds the role, but one month later, two months later, they're not even in your life anymore. But you're a woman of God. And I'm only saying that because we downcast the sinners. We, 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 we're like the religious people. We believe that we're so self-righteous, that we're better. We think about we're better. Like some of the church people, we just think we're better. No, you're not better. You're just like them. You just got put together a little bit more. You just put together a little bit more. You got the grace of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we have to start acknowledging our need for God. This is what happens when we acknowledge. This is going to be so simple. When we acknowledge God, he puts us on the right path. When we don't acknowledge God, we drift off, we go on the wrong path. The wrong path leads to chaos, destruction, and misery. And we get farther and farther from God. That's why Jesus says, follow me. You want to know why he says, follow me? He's saying, come with me. Stay close to me. Be in sync with me. He's saying, you can't follow me from a distance because if you follow me from a distance, you might start following your feelings again. Follow me. He's saying follow me because he's saying where I want to take you, nobody else could take you. Only I could take you there. I want to lead you beside the still waters. I want to lead you by, by, by the green pastures. I want to restore your soul. Does anybody need to be restored today? Does anybody need to be refreshed today? Does anybody need to be rejuvenated today? Guess what? You're in the right place. Just call on Jesus. Proverbs 3, 6, very famous scripture. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Meaning, I'm going to put you on the right path, and I'm going to lead you on the right path. But you're going to have to follow me, and you're going to have to be really careful, because when life shows up, you're going to be liable to trust in your feelings again. So what should we do? We got to acknowledge God. And, you know, a lot of times, man, we, we just call on the wrong people. We call the ex-boyfriend. We call the ex-girlfriend. We call the old connect. Yeah, I'm in San Bernardino. I know what's up. 
You call. You call because you want to run away. You want to you just let loose. But the answer isn't letting loose. The answer is calling on the one that can save you, calling on the one that can help you, calling on the one that can set you free. It says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's why you could be that sinner that lives your whole life, a selfish life, pleasing yourself. But when you're on your deathbed, you call on Jesus and he'll come like you never, ever sinned. Man, that's a great friendship. You got to ask yourself, you don't got a friendship like that where you could just do people like dirt and that they'll still be there for you? Ain't nobody, come on, that's, that, that's not even, man, that ain't even possible anymore. Number two, Jesus is connected to the sinner. Everybody say connected. Man, there's a link. There's a bond. There's a relationship that he constantly offers you even when you don't want it. Let's go to Luke 15, 1 through 2. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Like, think about that. It says notorious. Like, these were the baddest of the baddest, the most day. These were people that you probably wouldn't even want to hang around. But guess what? Jesus wanted to hang with them. They often came to listen to, to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. In Matthew it says, Jesus had a banquet for all the sinners. So I want you to think about this, whether you were in elementary school, middle school, high school, and, and especially if you were like new to a school, this, this probably happened to you, you got your lunch tray, you're in the cafeteria, and you're trying to find a place to sit, and for some reason, there's nowhere to sit. And you're looking around, trying to find a place to sit, and there might even be a, a, a place for you to sit, but nobody's scooting over. Like, how would you feel? And see, see, he probably knows what it's like, because you being that, first, that kid at school with no friends, you ain't got no company. You, right, you're, you're just trying to place that, you're trying to find a, a seat so that you could be accepted, you could be loved. And I think a lot of us, like in high school, there was the cool table, there was the, the sports table, there was the, the gangster table, there was the, the, the popular girl table, there was the, the smart people table, right? There's all these tables, but all these tables, we sat at these tables because we wanted acceptance, we wanted company, we wanted to feel like we were a part of something. But just imagine being in a cafeteria and nobody wants to give you a seat. How would that make you feel? I guarantee you this, you'd feel uncomfortable. You'd feel alone. You'd probably be a little scared. But I want to tell you this, despite all those feelings, Jesus has space for you at his table. Jesus has space for you at his table. Guess what? There's not only space, there's always room for the sinner at his table. Jesus has a special seat. Like when you come into this room, you see, you see the special seats. Like, like he, has a, he, has a, he has a sign on the seat reserved for sinner. Yeah, you're laughing, but he, hey, he had a special seat. So some of us were going to the wrong table. And we're going to the wrong table and we're trying to fill ourselves. We're trying to fill it. Right? We're trying to find fulfillment at all these wrong tables. Stop eating at the wrong table. Stop going to the wrong table. Jesus wants you to sit at his table. Why? He wants to sit with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to listen to you. He wants relationship with you. If you're at the wrong table, it doesn't matter what you eat. You're always going to be empty. Stop going to the wrong table. If you're in here today and you, you, you can ask yourself, man, I've been going to the table. I've been going to this table. I've been going to the drug table. I've been going to the alcohol table. I've been going to, to the money table. Right, right, right? Because hey, when it comes to money, money drives your life. Money's like a little God in your life. You go to all these tables. Jesus is saying right now, forget all those tables. 
come to my table. There's peace at my table. There's purpose at my table. There's love at my table. There's acceptance at my table. There's healing at my table. There's forgiveness at my table. There's deliverance at my table. There's breakthrough at my table. Son, daughter, come to my table. I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. Forget about all those tables and come and sit with me. I like sitting at that table. There's always a table for you, son. There's always a table for you, daughter. God has a special seat for every sinner in the room. Can we give God some praise? Now, Jesus, we're talking about connection. Man, he had such a strong connection with his flock that even when one, somebody say one, when one strays away, when one drifts off, like Jesus can't just sit and do nothing about it. Like when you're going through it, he's going to do everything that he can to get a hold of you. He has such a strong connection with his flock that even when one sheep strays away or one person wanders off, he passionately, passionately pursues the lost until they are found. Go to Luke 15, 4 through 7. If a man has a hundred sheep and one, somebody say one, gets lost, what will he do? What will he do? Won't he leave the 99 in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? Like, it's a constant pursuit. Like, he never stops trying to get a hold of you. I remember one time I got tired of doing dirt in my city, so I had to go do dirt in L.A. So I'm like, I don't want to get caught in my city, so I want to go to another city. And if I go to another city, it's, it's, just, it's just better, right? So, so I'm, I'm on, you know, and at this point in my life, I'm, I'm starting to get my act together a little bit, meaning I wasn't, you know, starting to turn down. But anyway, so I'm in the car. I'm going to go do dirt in LA, and I'm driving, and I got Tupac, I got California Love, I got Gangster's Paradise, I got Biggie, I got Bone Thugs and Harmony. Man, I was on a mission. I was on a mission. But in the car, as I'm driving, the frequency of the radio station changed. And all of a sudden, it's a worship song. And it's a, I'm like, what the heck? Like, what is this? I turn it off right away. So I was like, man, and, but that was God trying to get a hold of me. There's other times in my life where, where in the neighborhood, you know, I, I didn't hang around the best people, but every now and then it would be like the craziest person on my street. Like he'd go to church, he'd get touched by God, he'd get an encounter with God, and then he comes back to the block and he would tell me, Drew, you need to give your life to the Lord. You need to get right with God. I'm like, what? Like, you, like, steal, you shoot, and you rob people, like, every other day. And you're trying to tell me, like, like, but it would always be the craziest person that would tell me, you need to get right with God. But it was God trying to get a hold of me through a person. God will use anybody, right? So, it would, like, I, like, you know, I wasn't seeking God, but this is the truth. We're not seeking God. It's God that's seeking us the entire time. So it says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he will joyfully carry it home. Joyfully carry you home. Joyfully pick you up joyfully clean you up, joyfully surround you with his love. He's going to joyfully love you back to life with the love and power of Jesus Christ. It says carry it home on his shoulders, meaning there's times in your life where you're so tired. There's times in your life where you're so exhausted. And I've been there where you can't even pick yourself up. And Jesus, he gets down low with you, and he says, son, I'm right here. 
daughter, I'm right here. I know it's painful. I know it's tormenting, but I'm here with you right now. And just because everybody left you, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. I'm going to pick you up, and I'm taking you back home. I'm taking you back to the Father's house. I'm taking you back to the flock. I'm taking you back to your purpose. He's a friend that will pick you up when nobody picks you up and you can't pick yourself up. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. Jesus is saying, celebrate with me. Celebrate with me. This person was lost. This person was blind. This person was scared. But they're no longer blind. They're no longer scared. And I have rescued them. Celebrate. Let's celebrate that God has rescued us and he's going to rescue more through you. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven. More joy in heaven over one, everybody say one, lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Amen. Let's think of this word loss. Loss is the best word to describe a person's condition without the Savior. Loss is the best word to describe a person's condition without the Savior. Lost people cannot serve their purpose. And they lack the ability to return to where they belong. They must be found. There's a constant pursuit for the lost one. Lost sheep are God's number one priority. Luke 19.10, it says, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. This was the mission of Jesus, to reach the lost sinner. Like, we got to think about that. He knew his mission. He was passionate about his mission. And if you're in the room today, you are his mission. He wants to reach you today. Don't fight what he has for you. When I think of connected, I think, I think, I think Jesus, he just wants relationship with you. And I pray that today that you would be open to relationship with him. Amen? Let's go to point number three. Jesus is committed to the sinner. So he talked about he has compassion for the sinner. He's connected to the sinner. Jesus is committed to the sinner. When I think of committed, I think obligated to a person, dedicated to a person, devoted to a person, and willing to give time and energy to, willing to listen to. And I think about this, when I think of committed, having promise to be involved in a plan of action, like Jesus has a plan of action for those who need to be rescued. Like, he's not just going to sit back and do nothing. He's going to move. He's going to get up. He's going to search for you. He's going to long for you. He's going to passionately pursue you until you open up your eyes, until you open up your heart, that if you're in a room like this, you don't have to stay bound anymore. You could be free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. So let's go to Luke 15, 13 through 18. Now in this portion of Scripture, most people call this portion of Scripture the prodigal son. But I'm going to call it a loving father. In fact, father is mentioned in Luke 15 11 times. So let's pay attention. Luke 15, 13 through 18. A few days later, the, b before this, the, 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 the father is giving his two sons their inheritance. So it says, a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings, 
and he moved to a distant land. Moved to a distant land means he just got so farther and farther and farther from God. Has anybody ever felt like they were so far from God? Like you could be in a room like this and still feel far from God. And it says, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. And this is the truth about sin. Sin is pleasurable. Sin is fun for a season. I remember when I was in my sin, I had a ball. I had fun. Like I had, I had man, I, I just had a lot of fun. Like I love being a hustler. I love doing all the dumb stuff that I did. And this is the truth. Even though it was fun, it caught up to me. There was a season where I started feeling the residue of sin, the consequences of sin. And when, when, when the hustling was fun and the being a womanizer was fun, all of a sudden I went through a season of depression, loneliness, suicidal thoughts, and I couldn't shake it even if my life depended on it. So I start feeling the consequence of sin, and this is the truth. Sin is pleasurable, but it's going to rob you in the long run. It's going to rob you of your peace. It's going to rob you of, of your joy. It's going to rob you of your purpose and your relationships. And some of us, we're looking for a temporary high and a temporary getaway. You're only feeling more broken, more empty, and you're trying to find fulfillment in things and people that could never fulfill you in the first place. You're, you're going to the wrong table, and you, it's just like the woman of the well. She was thirsty, but she was going to the wrong well. And some of us were going to the wrong well, and we're drinking. And guess what? You're still thirsty. You're still empty. You're still not satisfied. That's why Jesus said, if you drink from this well, you're going to be thirsty again. But he said, daughter, if you drink from my well, I will give you everlasting life. Now, it's not a sin to be thirsty, but I want to ask you a question. Where are you getting your water from? You've been going, you've been drawing from the wrong well. You've been drawing from the well of relationships. You've been drawing from the well of, of money. You've been drawing from the well of, of food, right? We can, we can talk about food too, right? Because the Holy Spirit is supposed to be your comforter, but food has become your number one comforter. We don't talk about that, but um, yeah. So it says he wasted all his money in wild living. Man, he had a ball. He had fun. But guess what? The money ran out. And guess what? Guess what? The friends will leave you. Guess what? The money does run dry. Guess what? People do turn their backs on you. They do stab you in the back. They do do un unthinkable things that you never thought that they would do. And guess what? You're all alone. And guess what? You're in a room like this. You're not alone. All you got to do is call out on the one that is ready to move on your behalf. And let me tell you this, in my deepest and darkest moments, it's not the thought out prayer. It's the most simplest prayers like this. Lord, I need you. Lord, please help me. Right here. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I missed it. And whenever I've been in my deepest and darkest moment, he always shined his light upon me. It said, about this time, the money ran out. A great famine swept over in the land, and he began to starve. Remember, sheep without a shepherd, they starve. He, persu he, per he persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Now, he's just, he's so desperate, I'll take the most disgusting job that anybody could take. And he said, I'm willing to do it. Now, the young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs began to look good to him. Now, how many of you know when, when sin robs you and when sin strips you of all your value and all your dignity, you begin to get a little bit more desperate? And some of you know what it's like. When you're desperate, you're willing to try anything. And some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You didn't have no money, but you walked for miles to get the next fix. It said no one gave him anything when he finally came to his senses when he finally came to his senses meaning there's going to be a time and a moment in your life 
where you're going to have to come to your senses and you're going to have to start to acknowledge God and you're going to have to say, wait a second, I've been doing it wrong. Wait a second, I've been leading myself. Wait a second, I'm that sheep without a shepherd. Wait a second, I'm tired of being lost. Wait a second, I need a call on Jesus. I need him to be the shepherd of my life so he could lead me, so he could guide me, so he could feed me, so he could protect me. Is there anybody in the house that knows what I'm talking about? Because he saved you and he rescued you and you know what it's like to no longer be lost. I know what it's like to be lost. That's why I'm in the streets every single week. I know what I felt. I know how scared I was. Like, like the, the thoughts were so loud. Like, I'd have dreams of, of driving off the freeway. And it was the same freeway that I would. My mom was living in Redlands, and there's an off-ramp to go to Redlands, and there's an off-ramp that takes you back to the other way. And I'd see myself in the dream with my hand on the wheel. And every single dream, I would see my hand drifting off to the left. And the car would drive off. And every single time I would drive that road home, I'd get a visual of that dream. And I'm in the car. And I see my arm. And a part of me wants to drift. But there was something else in the car that was fighting for my behalf. I dreamt that dream so many times. And I just got, I got tired of life. Sin robbed me of everything good that I had. And the suicidal thoughts were so loud, I just wanted them to stop. Like, I understand when people, like, when I hear about a person committing suicide, it breaks my heart because I know that could have been me. And people that commit suicide is because the lies are constant. The assaults are are constant, and all they want is the voices to stop. And, and you, you guys, you got to understand, we have a loving father that wants to help heal you from those tormenting thoughts, to heal you from that trauma, to heal you from those bad nightmarish dreams. You don't have to do life on your own anymore. We got a father that loves us. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs began to look good to him. But it said no one gave him anything. So he wanted to eat the pods. He couldn't even get that. When he finally came to his senses, he said, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. Some of you guys are dying spiritually. You're empty, you're lonely, you're depressed. And this is for the person that's serving in ministry. Yeah, you're doing all that serving just to cover up the pain that you're dealing with. Serving cannot heal you. Only he could heal you. He said, at home, even the hired servants have enough food to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. He said, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. So he came to his senses, but he understood, he understood the consequences of his sin. He began to develop godly sorrow. Let's go to Luke 15. Let's skip down to verse 20. So he returned home to his father. Pay attention. He returned home to his father. And while... He was still a long way off. His father saw him coming. So the father wasn't just sitting on the porch with his feet kicked up. Father every day was out in the fields. Is that my son? Is that my daughter? I know they're coming home. I know, I know they are. Is, is that her? Is that him? I know they're coming. See, he's, he's a loving father. He doesn't just sit and wait for you to come to him. He goes out and he looks for you. He said, he said while, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion. Everybody say compassion. He ran to his son. He ran to his son. 
embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned both against heaven and you. See, the son understood the consequences of his sin. He understood that sin ripped him off. And he also understood that, yes, sin was pleasurable, but sin has robbed me of everything. And now he's saying, I understand now. And some of us, we got to come to our senses where we got to say, I'm going to stop going to that sin. I'm going to stop going to that drug. I'm going to stop going to that high. I'm going to stop running away from God. And I'm going to run to God today. He said, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. And that's why some of us are hesitant to come to God. I was hesitant to come to God because of all the things I did. I was ashamed of myself. Like my father taught me how to be a man of God. And when he passed, when he, when, when, when he passed away, I was 16 years old. I did everything that he taught me not to do. And because I did everything that he taught me not to do, I walked around with guilt. I walked around with shame because I had a loving father. Everybody in my hood, nobody had a father but me. So I dealt with the guilt that, man, no, none of these guys had a father. I had a father, but I can't even live up to what he asked and taught me to do. And I have friends in the neighborhood. While I was doing dumb stuff, they'd be like, hey, bro, like, you actually had a good dad. Why are you doing the things that you're doing? I didn't know how, to, I just didn't know how to grieve with the loss of my father. I just turned to the streets. And this is the truth. I felt guilty. I felt ashamed. I felt like I could never come to God. Like, I disappointed my dad. If I disappointed my dad, I know I'm disappointing God. But I want to encourage somebody today. It doesn't matter what you've done. There's nothing that you could do to disqualify the grace and the love that he has for you. <laughs> nothing. He says, but his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Like, think about that. He said, quick, like, hurry up. This is serious. Like, my son is here. Pay attention. I've been waiting for this moment. And he's waiting. God is waiting for the moment for you to come to him. He's waiting for the moment for you to run to him. He's waiting for the, in your, in your brokenness, in your suicidal thoughts, in your pain, in your torment, in your loneliness. He's waiting, son. He's waiting, daughter. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. He said, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf that we have been fattening. Meaning they were already preparing the calf because they were expecting the son to come home. Notice this. The son came in his worst condition, but he gives him the best robe. He gives him the finest ring. He gives him sandals on their feet. And this is the love of God. He sees you at your worst, but he treats you as if you were at your best. It says, we must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead, but now he returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Let the party begin. Let's give God some praise that he rescued us, that he saved us, that he delivered us, and he's going to do more saving to the sinner today. Let's give him some praise that he came for the lost, that he came for the broken, he came for the confused, he came for me, he came for you, he came for us. Everybody stay standing. I met a young man named Frank. He came into my store a couple days ago. And when he came in, he came with his four-year-old son, Noah. And when he came in, you know, by title, I'm a business owner. But just because I'm a business owner, I have to understand that I'm still on mission. 
So he came into the shop, and he just said, man, it's my son's birthday. He said, I feel ashamed because my wife, she just talks about how bad I am of being a provider. She talks about that I'm not man enough. I'm not taking care of the family. I'm not doing the responsibilities that I should do. And he said, he said, man, I just need some help. It's my son's birthday. And he brought me in some shoes to sell, but these were shoes that we normally don't buy. I just began to listen to him. I began to empathize with him. I began to understand his pain. And I told him, I've been in your shoes before. I know what it's like to try your best. I know what it's like to try your hardest. I know what it's like to try to figure it out. But at the end of the day, you're still failing, you're not succeeding, and that the people around you, they're just beating you up. He just began crying, he just started crying in the shop. He's bawling in the shop. I said, this is what you gotta do, bro. You gotta just surrender your life to Jesus. Give everything to Jesus. And Frank, man, he's, he's crying. He wouldn't stop crying. And he said, man, I'm so sorry that I'm in here. I'm taking, I'm taking up all your time. I was like, no, nothing else matters more than you right now, Frank. I said, you matter. Little Noah matters. And right now, it's just me and you, and God is in the center of this whole conversation. The truth is, I was able to empathize because I know what it's like to be lost. I know what it's like to not have a savior. And for the person in here today, you may be lost, but I got good news for you. The father's in the house and you could be found today, amen? It said, while his son was away, he still had a heart full of love. While the son was away, the dad had a heart full of love. While his son was out running amok, while the son was out spending all his money on all the wildest things, the father still had a heart full of love. He still had a heart that was forgiving. He still had a heart that was ready to receive his son. And I want to tell you today, God is here, God is now, he has a heart that's full of love, he's waiting for you, he's waiting to forgive you, and he has a heart that's ready to receive you today. No matter the condition he came back in, Jesus isn't asking you to come to him sober. He's not asking you to fix yourself. He's not asking you to clean yourself. He's not asking you to go through a 12-step program. Jesus is saying, you don't got to figure it all out. Jesus is saying, I have it figured, I have it figured out. And he's saying, come to me, son. Come to me, daughter. Come as you are. Come to, the, come to me. And he's saying, you don't have to fix yourself. Just come to me and I will fix you. Jesus, the friend of sinners. He's calling sinners home today. He's calling sinners home today. Last verse, Matthew 9, 13. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want to show you mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous but those who know they are sinners. He didn't come for those who think they are righteous. He's came for those who know they are sinners. He came for every sinner in the room. But this is the truth. Repentance is the treatment plan and forgiveness is the cure. Let's give God some praise.
Repentance is the treatment plan. And forgiveness is the cure. For every person in the room, I just want everybody to just stop. This is a holy moment. Somebody's life is at stake. And you're that sinner. Remember, Jesus is a friend of the sinner. He wants relationship with you. He wants to do life with you. And this is what he wants to be a part of. He wants to be a part of your choices. He wants to be a part of your decisions. He wants to help you. But you have to be willing to receive from him. Jesus says, come to me, all those who are weak and heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. He's saying, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You don't have to be tired anymore. You don't got to be worn out anymore. You don't got to be depressed anymore. And I'm going to give you opportunity on the count of three to receive Jesus as the Lord over your life. Meaning, he is going to be the new leader over your life. You've been leading your own life. You've been leading your own decisions. You've been leaning on your own understanding. Today's the day to stop leading yourself. And today's the day to have a new leader. And that's the great shepherd. He wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. He wants to restore your soul. And today, today's the day for salvation. Today's the day for breakthrough. Today's the day for your healing. Today is the day that God is knocking on your door. Do not hesitate to invite him in. So on the count of three, you want to make that decision. I want that friendship with Jesus. I want that relationship. Drew, you, you talked about he had compassion for me. He, has, he wants to be connected with me. There's a seat open for me. And then Drew, he's committed to me even when I'm selfish. Yes. He loves you, son. He loves you, daughter. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, this is the bad news. He says, for the wages of sin is death. The price for sin is death. That's the bad news. But the good news, he says, but the free gift of eternal life is through Christ Jesus. In John 3, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have ever lasting life. He died on the cross so that you could be forgiven, you could be redeemed, and you could be born again. You don't have to be guilty anymore. You don't have to be ashamed anymore. You don't have to, be, you don't have to condemn yourself anymore. Jesus wants to set you free today. So on the count of three, don't let nothing stop you from raising your hand. He's a friend to you. He's longing relationship with you, and he's seeking you. He's pursuing you. You've been going through life tired. You've been going through life miserable, and you've tried to figure out, but Jesus is knocking at the door. And if you want to receive Jesus today, on the count of three, raise your hand. Don't let nothing stop you. This is the moment that's going to change your life forever. On the count of three, raise your hand if you want to receive Jesus. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you want to receive the Lord today. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand in the back, I see that hand in the back, I see that hand, 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 I see that hand. Let's give God some praise. Let's celebrate for all those people that said, I want the Lord in my life. I want him to be leader of my life. And if you raise your hand, this is your time. He said, my son was once lost, my daughter was once lost, but now they are found. Today's the day. Come on. Come to the front. Give us the honor and privilege to pray with you. And this is the sign of you being rescued, you being found, you being healed, you being delivered. From this moment on, your life will never be the same again. Come home, son. Come home, daughter. Don't let nothing stop you from this moment. This is your moment. God has love for you. He has peace for you. He has forgiveness for you. He has purpose for you. Thank you, Jesus.
proud of you, bro. Proud of you. Takes a real man to serve God. Proud of you, Tony. Let's give Tony some praise. He was once lost, but now he's found. Come on, we're going to need more people. If you're a DG leader, this is a holy moment. They were once lost, but now they're found. We got more. We got, we got groups of people up here. Come on, come on. Leaders, leaders. Come on, help us out real quick. There's so many people right here. There's so many families right here. Let's make sure everybody is accounted for because every person matters to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Look at, look at, look at our altar. Look at, all, look at all the people that said, I need a savior. I need a rescuer. I need a deliverer. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want everybody to look at me right now. In 2010, I made the same decision as you. I made a decision that I'm no longer going to live for myself. And I'm going to surrender my life, and I'm going to give everything to Jesus. My life has never been the same again. That's the greatest decision I've ever made. God's going to set you free. God's going to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He's going to give you desires to seek him, to pursue him, to live for him. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Your next step here is to get baptized this Wednesday. Wednesday. Everybody say Wednesday. Say, I'm all in. Wednesday, 6 o'clock, we're getting baptized. Amen? All right, everybody raise your hand as a sign of surrender. We're going to pray. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Jesus. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say it again. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Right now, if you're set out there in the crowd, I want you to just touch and agree. Pray for somebody right now. Pray for somebody right now. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Father God. In the name of Jesus, come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. Cleanse me from the inside out. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cleanse me from all of my ways. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for running from you. I'm sorry for not thinking about you. I'm sorry. For doing it on my own. I don't want to do it on my own. I need you. I need you. Lord Jesus, help me. I'm crying out to you, Lord. I need you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing me. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Thank you, Lord for dying for me so that I could be forgiven, I could be redeemed, and I could be born again. I put my faith in you and not in myself. I put my trust in you and not in myself. I repent from all my ways, and I renounce all sin out of my life, out of my life. Devil, I rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, I come against all lies. I come against the depression. I come against the suicidal thoughts. I come against the fear. I come against the doubt. I break it right now. In the name of Jesus, leave me now. Leave me now. Holy Spirit, fill me now with your power, with your truth with your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'll never be the same again. From this day forward, I will live for you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give God some praise.